I'm your host, Marsha Florence with Just Ask. Today's show, ladies and gentlemen, is Just Ask the Doctor about colon health. Hurry back and join us. I'm your host, Marsha Florence with Just Ask. Today's show, ladies and gentlemen, is Just Ask the Doctor. And we have a doctor in the house, Dr. Lakeisha Brentley, MD. Good morning, Dr. Brentley. Good morning, Marsha. Thank you for having me. Girl, you don't know how glad I am to have you. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Brentley, you know what? It is such a wonderful segment to do with the doctor on hand because a lot of people will listen closely to what the doctor is saying. And then they take heed to some of the things that the doctor is saying because you said it. Okay, but on okay. every day uh, walking around, getting information from your friends and family, people normally don't follow it. So I wanted you to go into detail. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice. My name again is Dr. Lakeisha Bruntley. I'm a general surgeon in the metropolitan Detroit area. I trained at University of Michigan Medical School. I was born and raised in Highland Park, Michigan, and stayed in Michigan to continue with my practice in the area. I do general surgical care, which means I it encompasses surgery from the head, surgery from the head to the toes. Oh wow! Yeah, okay. lumps and bumps of any kind, surgery on the colon, surgery surgery on the breast, lumps and bumps of all sorts. So I do all the general surgical care. Okay, and you stayed right here in Michigan, got your education in Michigan, and you just passionate about Michigan. Passionate about Michigan. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. So okay, now in your practice mm -hmm. and you're a surgeon. Um, a patient can be can have a disorder anywhere on the body and you're part of a surgical team is that what it is? I'm in private practice which mm -hmm. means that patients are referred to me directly from their primary care doctors for whatever surgical issue that's ailing them. Okay okay because a lot of times when we think of MDs we're always thinking of oh, like well uh, I gotta give me an MD so we never think that, that the term MD is medical what? Doctor. Medical doctor, okay. Which means you could have studied in any particular area at all? That's true, and then you have further certification or residency training into the profession. So I did a residency in general surgical care, and that's five years of training, and then subsequently I went into private practice. Okay, all right, okay. Mm -hmm. So today we want to talk about uh, health care when providing colon care, rather. So tell us a little bit about health care in the colon. Yeah, it's important because colon cancer is the third leading cancer-related death that we see in the United States, and that's only second to breast and lung cancer. And it becomes particularly important when you talk about its impact on African Americans and in the community and the rates of death associated with it, and particularly our survival rates are less than other populations as well. I talk about it because we start with colon polyps and with that, we get over 200,000 colon polyps diagnosed every year, and that's across the United States. So we know that this is an important discussion and a disease that we need to follow because colon polyps go on to become colon cancer, and that's something that we have to make sure that we're aware of. So what makes people so afraid to go get a, what, uh, well, do you call it a, what is the test more or less when they go into the, to, to see if they have polyps, what is that called? We have several tests that we do, but the actual visualization of the colon is mm -hmm. done with the colonoscopy, mm -hmm. and that's the gold standard versus doing what's called a flexible sigmoidoscopy. And some of the audience will rem or the uh, uh, viewers will understand that because oftentimes they'll do a start of a procedure, meaning that they'll look at partial visualization of the colon, and that's a sigmoid sigmoidoscopy where you okay. look at the part of the colon versus looking at the full colon, which is a colonoscopy. Okay, because I do know a lot of people, and I'll say men especially, are fear taking, uh, getting a colonoscopy. Uh, the community is, there's several reasons why people don't get colonoscopies or particularly why we shy away from them. Mm. Time is one, having to take the time away to have the procedure done knowing that or, or the potential risk of having a diagnosis of a colon cancer can put fear and instill fear in people's heart. 
if they don't have, they think that it's associated with the cost, mm -hmm. when we actually have a, a good thing with the um, Affordable Care Act, is that we now are waiving the fees associated with the coinsurance as well as the um, deductibles for screening colonoscopies. So with that, mm -hmm. people can go and get a screening colonoscopy without incurring a cost with their insurance. And they probably don't even know that until and today. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. And they probably don't know that, so okay. I'm glad we're able to provide them that information. Okay. Because in, 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 this, in the study of knowing that, you know, you have one group of people who have, have went and had the procedure done, they say, oh, it's nothing. A lot of people say, no, no, I, I don't want to know. And I'm trying to figure out why wouldn't you want to know, you know, so that you can have preventive methods before it gets too late. I think it's just a fear factor. I think that people having to take time to do that as well as having relationships with their primary care doctors. A lot of the times we found that 30% of particularly African Americans have not been referred to having a colonoscopy from their primary care doctor. So healthcare providers have a very important role in regards to patients getting to mm -hmm. a gastroenterologist or a surgeon to get a scope or a colonoscopy. So how many times a year should a person have one? Well, that's it depends because First, we have different ways in which we screen for colon disease, particularly colon cancers. We look for blood in the stool, so a lot of patients will get cards, or they will have a card sent to their home or picked up, and then they have to give a stool sample. So this is uh, one of the cheaper ways to get an evaluation, however it missed disease. In addition to that, we have other studies where they look at the DNA associated with what's coming out of the colon just the same. So again, that's another one of the cards that you send in. In addition to that, we do the colonoscopies, flexible sigmoidoscopies. Those studies, depending on what age you are, are screened every three to five years or 10 years, depending on what risk factors you have. And that becomes important when we talk about how often do you get colonoscopies and what we find on the colonoscopy. Wow, that's a lot. But, it, but it's, it's good to know because a lot of people are not aware of the stages and then all of a sudden they go in and they say, you know, I'm stage one, stage two, stage, well, how many stages are there for colon cancer? Well, we go from stage one to stage four. Mm -hmm. So the staging is related to how bad the disease is. Okay. Yes. Okay. And normally if a person, say, this is my first time getting a colonoscopy, and then all of a sudden they find out they have a stage, stage three or stage four, that's because they didn't think early on in life that they should get a colonoscopy, and they just went this particular time, and it's worse than it could have been? Absolutely, because what we found, again, this becomes so important because when you look at the data for screening for African Americans, particularly, and my passion for being able to identify this because we often talk about the disparities of racial or ethnic mm -hmm. care or care associated with different ethnic groups. And what the American Society of Gastroenterologists have done is that they actually have a minority task force that looked at a data crossing 10 years and identifying that we needed to have colonoscopies done earlier. And not only that, that the, when we do get our colonoscopies, that the stage of disease is later. Wow. So the recommendations now, particularly for African Americans, is to get your colonoscopy at the age of 45 years old. Okay, okay, well I tell you what, Dr. Brindley, you said a wealth of information, we're gonna take a break and we'll be right back with some more helpful information about colon health. We'll be right back. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. And welcome back to the second half of the show. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I know you're listening closely to what Dr. Brentley is saying about colon health, so we're going to ask her some questions that we know you may be asking at home. So the first one is, what is a colon polyp? Yes, a colon polyp is a cluster of cells that's inside the colon and sometimes those cells can be abnormal. And then we call that an adenoma, which means that there's a growth that's uncontrolled. Okay, so what are some of the risks that, you know, that causes the polyp? Risk factors associated with colon polyps and colon cancer are, I have a diagram that gives an illustration of it just the same. Okay. And if uh, age greater than 50 years old, family history of colorectal cancer, personal history of colon cancer, polyps in the colon or the rectum before diagnosed, inflammatory conditions, most often called ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, uh, di familial diseases, meaning that's things that are associated with cancers mm -hmm. that the fan they go throughout the genes. The second ones, those are things that we cannot modify. The things that we can modify are alcohol consumption, smoking and tobacco use, 
being overweight and obese, not being physically active, consuming an abundance of red meats or processed products, in addition to having a diet low in fiber, fruits and vegetables. And what I don't have here, which I like to highlight, is having uncontrolled diabetes. That's also a risk factor for going on having colon polyps. Okay, okay. So what are some of the recommendations? The recommendations are just that changing those things that we can change, mm -hmm. particularly those things that are listed as modifiable factors. Getting active, watching what we eat, keeping our meat low in animal products, our diets low in animal products. Okay. Those are the things that can decrease our chances of going on to become having colon disease. Okay, now some of the things like you said earlier about the family history, it can go in like it can may be the mom and may skip the the children but go into the grandchildren or something like that. One would think that a condition like colon cancer is brought on mostly by food products, smoking, alcohol consumption, but not family history. Some of the things that are associated, and I have an image that will give identification of what actually causes a colon polyp and subsequently going on to cancer, and I like to show that. Okay. So in the event that they're doing that, um, as we go through the diagrams, what do people look for or how would they know? First, again, with screening, we talked about colonoscopies, getting to your doctor and making sure that you're making a request for colonoscopy or screening associated with colon disease. Okay. In the colon, on this diagram here, you can see normal colon and it has all of these different labeling here. But what we do know is that there are changes in the genes that go on to lend to you having a cancer. So you start with normal colon, mm -hmm. it goes on and grow. We call it hyperproliferative or hyperproliferation. And then you go on to become an adenoma. Now when you see that picture of the adenoma, mm -hmm. there are different genes that start changing. When those genes start changing, it then goes on to become a cancer. And those things can be affected by not only just your family history, but also by the environmental factors, particularly the food that we're eating. Okay, okay. And you know, and that when you say by the food that we're eating, uh, I know that red meat plays a, a, a particular role in that. Uh, how about dairy? Dairy? Dairy, just the same. Dairy has a protein in it that causes inflammation in the gastrointestinal tract as well, so we have to be careful with dairy products also. Okay, okay. But you know what, uh, Dr. Brinley, we start off with uh, giving our children milk. So some of it may be breast milk and some of it may be milk from a can or whatever. How do we know we're not already aligning our children up to have this type of condition, even though we're starting young now? So right. we, we don't take the milk from them, what do we do? Well, that becomes complicated because we have a society that's dependent on animal products and drinking milks when we supplement it for our own. Mm -hmm. So as a result, in order to provide nutritional support for our children, if we're talking about children or as adults as well, there are different ways in for order you get calcium or other things that are required for a healthy developing child. And I'm not going to take on the milk industry. However, mm -hmm. I will say that we have to be careful about what we're putting in our bodies and that we have to know the effect of those things. Okay. One thing I do know is that cows don't drink their own milk. <laughs> after, That's true. After, okay. after they've been nursed away from their uh, mother. Okay. Okay, that is true. All right, all right. Well, you know, you're going to give a lot of people food for thought here, should we say. Yes. And they're going to be trying to think of how to change their diet. So mostly right. in changing your diet, should it be fruit and vegetables, nuts and things like that? I mean, or, or, or you know, because a person's not going to just stop eating meat, cold turkey, but they can. Absolutely. And it's portion control. One of the things that I advocate, particularly with my patient population, is just portion control. If you find yourself having to eat product, whether it be because of access or exposure or just the availability to have healthy foods, mm -hmm. is that I think that you have to watch your portion controls and then balance that with high fiber in a diet. What we want is for the food that you put in your body to have a better transit time, meaning coming from your mouth going to when you defecate or mm -hmm. have a bowel movement, that that's not delayed. Because what we do know is that those foods that sit inside the colon, particularly for animal products like meats to digest, it can be in the colon for weeks. And those things lend to changes in the mucosa or the changes in the colon. Now, I know this may be a, kind of an odd question to ask, but there are a lot of people who believe in getting colonics. How do physicians feel about colonics? I can't speak for the entire medical community. However, I do know that it's well understood that if you have colonics, that you are removing good bacteria. Mm -hmm. And when I say good bacteria, the number of bacteria that we need to protect us from the bad bacteria 
if you remove the good bacteria, you have an overwhelming amount of bad bacteria, and that can lead to, lead to disease as well. So we have to be careful with the colonics. Okay. Right. I would rather you just put more fiber in your diet. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, some people are like, okay, I don't eat red meat, I don't eat fish, mm -hmm. and then they're taking things out, and then they want to move the condition a little bit faster, move the waste a little bit faster by having colonics, which, you know, uh, helps in the weight loss, um, sometimes helps with the mental therapy of knowing that I have not digested the wrong thing or red meat or something like that. And I'm not saying that, you know, that falls under the line of vegetarians and vegans, but right. People who do mostly colonics do feel as though they are subtracting things that are harmful to them, such as red meat. You know? Well, looking at uh, evidence-based medicine is the best, and that is a lot of people would do it on their po own personal experiences, and that's fine. However, I must caution people who do colonics that you remove good bacteria from your colon that is helping you to stay, okay. to keep the colon healthy. Okay. Now, is the, and I know this is two different areas, but is the pancreas near uh, the colon, like, you know, if, if, if a person has colon cancer, would they end up mainly with pancreatic cancer too or vice versa? No, those are different relationships. Okay. Yeah, okay. the colon is a separate organ and the pancreas operation and function is separate, just okay. the same. Lately, it seemed like we've had a rash of pancreatic cancer on the rise mm -hmm. in comparison to other cancers that we always hear about, but now it seems like there's a a rise of pancreatic yeah, cancer. Yeah, it's actually going up. Well, again, those same risk factors. And one th the couple things that we do know are associated with pancreatic cancer is lifestyle. And that's associated with smoking and alcohol ingestion, definitely. Okay, and you know what? And I think with people who smoke, um, some people have been smoking since they were teenagers. And now they're in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, but they still smoke. Yeah. And sometimes most ailments, is, is, is my elders would tell me, the uh, element will go to the weakest part of their body, you know, so if there's something going wrong, well, it's just going to affect the weakest part of your body, so I'm still smoking. You know, you tell the person, well, you shouldn't smoke, and they've been smoking since they're 18, now they're 60, and they feel like, well, if I'm going to die from something, this will be it, and yeah. that might not be what it is, you know, it yeah. could be something else, but we're associating food and alcohol and tobacco consumption mm -hmm. with a lot of the ailments. And, and it's real. It's real. This is evidence-based medicine, and it's real. We know that there's a relationship between those conditions and or m cancers of sort. And even if a person is spared, particularly for years, mm -hmm. the issues associated with smoking, it's not necessarily just having a cancer. I know smokers that are debilitated on every measure. I'm talking from not being able to walk with claudication because their blood vessels have been affected, their heart has been affected. But those people still can function every day, and they feel that because they have not completely or had a diagnosis of cancer mm -hmm. or completely become debilitated, that they are spared the right. risk associated with smoking. And right. that's not a true that's statement. Not true. Okay, okay. All right, well, Dr. Fred, we're going to take another break. And you smokers heard that. We'll be right back. Appreciation. Pass it on. There's mom, you always were the perfect friend. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. I'm home. Over a million Americans at risk of foreclosure have been helped by making home affordable. Find out now what your options I'm are. Home where I belong. And welcome back to the last half of the show. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't have your pen and paper out, you should, because I know some of you have questions for Dr. Brentley or any of our guests. So you can always give us a call at 1-800-323-5336. 1-800-323-5336, Twitter, hashtag Marsha, and ask a question, and definitely ask a question in reference to your health. We like to know what you're thinking so that people like Dr. Brentley can come back and fill you in with some answers that you have questions about. Now, on that note, I did have a question for Dr. Brentley about probiotics. Yeah. What is your take on probiotics? It's popular right now, and mm -hmm. it's one of those things that has been commercialized, and it introduces bacteria to the colon when you ingest it, and the thought is that it's supposed to give you good bacteria that helps with digestion of foods. My position, and it always will be the same, is just watching how you eat. Again, we talked about that balance between good and bad bacteria. I don't think we, we would ever want to disrupt that because it will lend you to having disease of the colon. Okay, okay. Well, I want to prepare our viewers to know that we're getting ready to um, put on the screen some very sensitive material that Dr. Brentley has brought in to talk about colon and, and the polyps. So I uh, just want you to know this is a sensitive piece of material, but take a look. 
Yeah, okay. the first image is the picture of the colon polyp, and it's identified on the colonoscopy. And the particular image shows that you can see that rising area of the tissue, and that's called a polyp. And that can be divided into several things. It can be, again, growth of the normal tissue, or it can go on to become an adenoma. And adenomas become important because that's when it goes on to becoming a cancer. And on the image that I have here, it talks about the risk associated with the adenomas, these growths in the colon going on to becoming cancer. We start with a tubular adenoma, and if one has had a colonoscopy, they've been told, and they've been told they had a polyp, it's important that you know what the histology is of the polyp. Because if it's something associated with a villous adenoma, you can see here on this diagram, 40% chance of it going on to become malignant. So that becomes very important in regards to how we look at the picture. Also, the size, the size, the size. Size is the most important factor associated with the risk of malignancy with the polyp, and that's what you want to know. What was the size of the polyp? How many were there? Higher number of polyps, higher risk of colon or cancer, and you want to also change the screening associated with it. If you have more polyps, you get screened more often and more readily. Okay, so if a person say, well, the doctor comes out and said you had a couple of polyps, is yes. that something to really be worried about? We should always be worried about when there's an abnormal growth associated with an organ in our body. So okay. it makes you bring about change, changing what you're eating, changing how you're living your lifestyle, mm -hmm. meaning that getting your activities in, because we know all of those things affect the outcomes associated with colon disease. Okay, all right. So the diagram um, that shows all the different col uh, colons, mm -hmm. what is that? This is important because when we start talking as a surgeon, I start salivating because <laughs> this is what I do. And if colon disease becomes an issue, meaning that you have polyps that are too large to be removed from the anus, because we can remove the polyps from the anus or through the colonoscopy procedure. And most often that colonoscopists will take the smaller polyps and remove them with the colonoscopy at the time of the procedure. However, there's sometimes when those colon polyps are much larger and they're not able to come out with that conservative measure, meaning that you're not having to undergo a surgery. If this, if it is the case where they're large, you now have to have segments of your colon taken out. And this just shows where the different segments of the colons that are removed, depending on where the polyp is identified. This is really important for, again, African Americans, because all of the screening tubes that we use, if it's not a full colonoscopy, it can become a problem because most of the tumors associated with African Americans has been found, have been found on the right side of the colon. Mm -hmm. So if you're just looking at disease on the left side of the colon, then you're not gonna, you're gonna miss that portion of disease that's identified on the right side of the colon. Okay, so that's why they should have a, uh, not a partial colonoscopy, but a full, a full colonoscopy. But who would recommend a partial colonoscopy? I mean, is that, is that something they normally do or? Sometimes we do, because okay. it's a procedure that some people are less anxious about. Mm -hmm. It doesn't entail a larger, uh, or it's the same sedation, meaning that you'll go to sleep or have yourself in a twilight sleep for mm -hmm. the procedure. But it's something that if you wanna just do a quick screening versus a full screening, okay. the one risk to that is that if you have that procedure like a flexible sigmoidoscopy where we only look at partial portion of the colon, if you found, if we find something, you then go on or come back to have a full colonoscopy. Okay, so the colostoma types this here on this diagram, that you says, colos is that right, colostoma? Colostomy. Colostomy, I'm and sorry. The, yeah, that's okay, this becomes important because if these tumors are so big and they're not able to be resected, meaning taken out and the colon put back together, mm -hmm. you end up with the bag. And Correct. this is why I tell patients all the time, go get your screening, get your colonoscopy so that you don't have to deal with this scary thing called the bag or having to have a bag placed where you have to have a colostomy, whether temporary or permanent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm looking at this diagram with uh, the four different areas. So that means that uh, on one side is the ascending? Yes, that's the right side of the colon. Okay. Okay, and this net normally what they call the ileostomy. Yes. Okay. The ileostomy will be can be placed there just the same, and that's from the small intestines, mm -hmm. and that's when the right side of the colon is removed and is unable to be put back together. Then we give an ileostomy. Okay. Okay. All right. And then the descending, 
uh, what's that? Sigmoid. And the sigmoid colostomies. Okay. And that's the most common. That's mm -hmm. the area that's most common because most of the tumors oftentimes are found in that right side or that left yes, side of the colon side. as well. Yes. Okay. And that's where, now I'm going to just correct me if I'm wrong. The ileostomy is more liquefied um, waste and the descending on the left side is the more subtle or solid, solid waste. Yes. And the okay. reason why is because the right side of the colon absorbs water. So if you remove the right side of the colon, then you don't get the water absorption. Mm -hmm. So if you have to just pull up the ileum or the ileostomy, then you will have that liquid stool mm -hmm. because you haven't had it trans transport through the right colon where you end up having this water removed. That's the function okay. of the right colon. Okay, you know, and, and Dr. Brenly, I really want to, I appreciate you going over this uh, with me and the viewers because a lot of people don't understand when they have a stoma how it came about, you know, what was the procedure mm -hmm. for not just removing the cancer or the mass itself, but the reason why it's on the left or the reason why it's on the right. Mm -hmm. They just say, I just, I just wear this bag now. And I don't think they really know, you know, the history or the effect of what it's doing, you know. It's and some of people are looking at it like, is it reversible? I want to make sure I can, you know, it can be reversed. Now, what is the reverse if a person is eligible? Is that to, for the left side where they say they can reverse it and, uh, return you back to be able to eliminate waste from the from the anal? Yes. We can reverse colostomies. It doesn't matter what part of the colon that is from. It just mm -hmm. depends on the condition. Sometimes if the condition does not dictate, so if you have a larger tumor of some sort or mm -hmm. a large amount of infection and disease that requires that that area is unable to be deemed to be safe to put an ostomy back together with the rest of the colon, then it will be a permanent colostomy. However, most of the time, if it's a condition, whether it be a colon cancer, if it's not an obstructive lesion, we take the colon out. It may be temporary. We let things cool down, mm -hmm. and then we put the colon back together. So it's okay. an option for both. There's okay. another conditions, of course, like we talked about, inflammatory conditions, diverticular disease, mm -hmm. diverticulitis, very common, oh, yeah. where you have these pouches on the colon. And when that happens, that inflammation or that swelling can cause you to get a colostomy temporarily. And then after it resolves, you put the colon back together. Well, on that on that note, I can I can see how this will affect, you know, our viewers and and wanting to do more about getting their colon, you know, checked out or even getting a colonostomy. Period. I think mm -hmm. that once this show airs, people will be paying attention to the fact that hey, I at least need to go get a colonostomy once. And let me ask you this before we close: What's the youngest age a person should get a colonostomy? Well, that's a tough question. However, I'll give you this. 45 years young is the age you need to have your screening started. And American Cancer Society actually says 40. So it depends on who you're looking at in regards to or what source that you get in regards to the recommendation. But right now, we are all in agreement that 45 is the age in which an adult, mature adult, should start getting their screening. If there's a family history of cancer, it should be 10 years prior to the age that that person under 40 was diagnosed with colon cancer. Okay, okay. Well, Dr. Brilli, I, I appreciate this. Honestly, I do. And would you come back and see us again? Absolutely. Okay. So, I, I, I'm, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just choking because I'm like, wow, that is true. I mean, a lot of things that we go through in life, we try to figure out how do we get there and we don't know. And then we're too afraid to ask. And what I always tell you, just ask. So, we want uh, to thank Dr. Brilli. Really much. Thank you so much You're for welcome, coming Marcia. to join Thank us. You for having me. And we hope that she'll come back. And you know what? If you have a show idea, you need to give us a call at 1 800 323 5336. Twitter hashtag. Let me know what you think, as well as if we have questions for Dr. Brentley. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm your host from uh, Marshall Forms for Just Dance. And what do I always say? If you have a question, a general question, don't be afraid. And if you have a question about a person with disability, don't be afraid. Just ask. Thank you.